My name is Wyatt Graham, and I am joined by Gray Sutanto, who uh, has some background in Herman Bovink, and I'd love to learn from him today and to talk to him. So, Gray, can you just briefly introduce yourself, your ministry, your kind of faith, and your future prospects? Yeah, thanks so much, Wyatt. It's great to be here. Um, I had done my PhD work on Herman Bovink at the University of Edinburgh under uh, James Huglinson, focusing on... Uh, the relationship between theology and philosophy and epistemology, particularly in Boving's writings. Uh, submitted that 2017, came back to Jakarta, and for the last three years have been uh, helping with the church plants here, preaching, teaching as a pastor at Covenant City Church. I was ordained and the International Presbyterian Church, the UK Presbytery. And uh, so, yeah, I've been here for the last three years in Jakarta. Uh, recently, I've just been appointed to be a systematic theology assistant professor at RTSDC. Looking forward to getting there as soon as immigration opens up again. Yeah, we hope you can get there. Um, so you did your dissertation at Edinburgh, and as I understand it, you studied Bovink there, and you've also edited or contributed to a couple books on Bovink. Can you tell us about those projects? Yeah, thanks. Uh, the first work that we had edited it was myself and Corey Brock. We both we're doing our PhDs on Bavink, uh, similar topics as well. Uh, he was working on Bavink's use of Friedrich Schleiermacher, and I was also taking a look at Bavink's sources for his own uh, work in theology and philosophy, right? So looking at his German sources, his medieval sources, and so on. And we both uh, were really working very closely with his 1908 Stone Lectures called The Philosophy of Revelation, Stone Lectures given at Princeton Seminary at the time. And uh, that's really where we were spending a lot of our days in and we were simply talking about how this needs to be updated there were some translation liberties they're taken there in the older english translation we just wanted to show where Boving, for example uses german terms but the english uh translation didn't show that it was actually using a foreign german term here and we just want an addition that tells us hey when Boving says this he's using an english word he's not using a, the dutch word for this or when he's using, when he's saying this, he's actually using a German phrase. So he's referring to thinkers, right? Because he's using these phrases to signal his dependence and who he has in mind when he's using these these thinkers, right? So so we wanted to show in a new, updated way uh, all of these different phrases that he was using, which also signals his his sources as we're going through those lectures for our dissertation. So we edited an updated translation of that. Uh, with Hendrickson Press that came out in 2018, Philosophy of Revelation, with a nice Mondrian cover, um, because Mondrian was very much influenced from his uh, neo-Calvinistic heritage. And then uh, a year later, we had also published a translation of his 1904 work, Christian Worldview. Uh, this is a much shorter work, and I think in some ways it's a prequel to his Philosophy of Revelation. He explicitly says that Philosophy of Revelation was kind of his expanding of what he said in the Christian Worldview. And that particular work, Christian Worldview, has never been translated before. Um, it's quite brief in the Dutch. I think it's just about 120 pages in the original Dutch. And um, that was translated by myself, Corey, and James Eglinton, our supervisor, who was such a great help uh, through our studies and for this translation. And they came out with Crossway just uh, a year ago now. Yeah. Wow. So there, there does seem to be, at least I've noticed, a bit of a resurgence in interest in Herman Bobbank. And... I'm sure some of your work has contributed to at least his name popping up because you see it on, you know, social media or bookstores or whatever. Uh, before we get to that, could you just, I'm sure a lot of people maybe have heard his name or maybe even not. Just tell us like who Herman Bovink is. And yeah. <laughs> when did he live and basically why, why are we even talking about him? Yeah, that's, that's a good uh, introductory question. That's important. Uh, Bavink was born 1854, died 1921. He was a Dutch Reformed theologian. He was trained at Leiden University. Actually, he did his PhD on the ethics of Hodrick Zwingli. And uh, Bavink is, uh, I think, oftentimes considered as kind of Kuiper's right-hand man, the kind of theologian by Kuiper's side, living under Kuiper's shadow. But I think it's only until recently uh, we've seen that Bavink is a genius in his own right and uh, had theological insights and writings that should be uh, read on its own terms and not just in light of what Kuiper had said, though, of course, they were very much working closely together in the Free University of Amsterdam, uh, thinking about what it means to be reformed and to stand on 
classical reform orthodoxy in a uh, very different world, right? In a modern uh, intellectual milieu. So that's who Bavink was. He was um, a professor at Kampen for a while uh, uh, before he was a professor at the Free University of Amsterdam. And he had written, of course, the probably he's, he's best known for this work, the four volume uh, Reform Dogmatics, which had been translated uh, between 2003 to 2008. And that's really, it's amazing that that's been just translated just a few years ago, really, right? And after that has been translated, people are now digging into him and seeing that, wow, his theology is not only biblically exegetical, it's also standing on church history. I think oftentimes people pit those two things against one another. People say, well, you know, you want to be just exegetical. You don't want church history to corrupt your thought or something like that. But actually in Bavin, you see both. He was very much biblical, but at the same time, he was standing upon the insights of the ancient, medieval, and reformed divines. But at the same time, he didn't just seek to repristinate what older theologians have said. He was very much convicted to say that theology has to be done for today. And so in, in a modern context, how do we, in his own time anyway, communicate the same old faith in a new and fresh way that might be effective for our hearers' hearts, right? That be compelling to them. So I think that's why Bavink is attractive to so many people because he wants to be both biblical. He wants to stand on church history, but at the same time, he's just, he's not just a historical theologian. He, he gave us an example of how do we stand on the past, but at the same time labor for the future. Mm. So his work, really must have come into prominence in North America between 2003 and, and eight with those English translations. That's basically how I'm, I'm sure I was first introduced to him. I can't remember exactly. Um, why do you think, like, why do you think he's kind of hit a nerve in terms of theological discourse? It, it appears to me that people, whenever they talk about Herman Bovink, it's kind of like he's the last great light or he's a uh, very uh, helpful interpreter or whatever. What, what makes him so compelling, do you think? Yeah, a, a great question. And, you know, I think you're right that the English translations uh, played such a pivotal role in bringing Bobbing to be known in the Anglophone world. Um, but I think before the English translations came, right, there was this kind of mythical Bobbing that existed because Burkhoff mentions him, speaks highly of him. Gerhardus Voss, of course, was in correspondence with him. People know his work through mentions of him. And, you know, Burkhauer, for example, who was hmm. translated before Bobbing was, always engages and interacts with Bavink's work. Bart mentions Bavink positively and Bart rarely mentions anyone before him positively, right? And so uh, there's just this mythological figure of Bavink, like everybody's been reading him. It seems that everybody's depending on him. We just don't know what he said. Um, we know that he was a right hand to Kuiper. He was, he was there went, alongside Kuiper, but we don't really know what he said. So when he finally was translated, people were eager to eat it up, eager to, to read him. Why did he struck a nerve? I think... Uh, for one of the reasons at least was what I've mentioned before. I think a lot of people, especially in contemporary evangelicalism, pit biblical theology against historical or systematic theology, right? Uh, they want to be anti-speculative. They want to be uh, rooted in the biblical text. And oftentimes that means pitting what they're reading in the scriptures from what had been said before in church history. Uh, or on the other hand, uh, there's this kind of, historicizing where theology is reducible to just what what does the, what did the, what did theologian x say about this particular doctrine and i think what boving exemplifies is that the work of the theologian is so broad that it must encompass both that actually yes you're rooted in the biblical text but the church has been reading the bible for for centuries together right and we should be gleaning from the insights of these these uh giants who came before us and so when you're reading Boving, you see this pattern where he starts out with exegesis. He talks about all the biblical passages that he thinks is relevant to the particular doctrine, draw some insights from them. And then you, you see this genealogical tracing out from the church fathers to the medieval, to the reform, to the modern age. And so he describes it first and kind of just tries to trace out, here's the lines of thought. And finally, we get to today. Here's my contemporary restatement of the doctrine or my fresh articulation of the doctrine, such that the fresh articula articulation that Bavink offers doesn't just come out of nowhere, so to speak, because you kind of see his 
evaluative concerns come up in his historical descriptions of, let's say, Augustine or Aquinas and uh, uh, the Reformed divines, the Turretin, Van Maastricht, all these guys uh, crop up and involving. And he always has his own voice in it. And when he says what he says, you can see how he also stands upon those particular voices collectively. <clears throat> but he's also incorporating modern thought, right? Um, something that, here's probably the second thing that, that strikes a nerve for us in Bavink is that Bavink is very much uh, a man of the modern age in the sense that he doesn't see modernity as simply an enemy to fight. We can say, I mean, one th something that really comes out in his writings is that he believes that grace is only against sin. And so it's not against nature as such, and it's not against culture as such. And so he's saying, contrary to a lot of his contemporaries, we're modern people and we shouldn't despise that. We shouldn't despise the fact that we're in the modern age. Of course, we're gonna disagree a lot with many of the philosophers of the modern age, but we're a man of our time and grace isn't against nature or culture as such. So we should embody the modern age in a way that stays faithful to the past, but it seems I'm learning from these philosophies that we're encountering. So he wasn't afraid to engage with his modern day. I think those two things, his rootedness in the past, his genealogical understanding of where he stands, and also at the same time, this stance of a renaissance and embracing where he is and the location and the time that he's in, those two things are really compelling for, for many of the readers. I'm interested in the, in the last point that you made about his sort of ability to engage with his current kind of cultural milieu, his current world of modernity that he is in. I'm reminded that in the 16th century, if you read reformers, they're commenting on uh, Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics. They're writing tomes of natural law. Um, they have a really strong sense in which nature, though fallen, is able to still speak and reveal truth. There's a way to discern mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And it, it strikes me as that you, you see that in Herman Bovink and, or you're saying you do, I, I guess I don't know by experience, but I, I'm trusting you. And we, we've kind of moved the pendulum, I think in some circles, at least in the late 20th century and the early 21st century, where we're highly suspicious of nature. Mm -hmm. We don't trust it, culture mm -hmm. and nature in the world. What do you think, um, like, why does Herman Bovink have that kind of um, discerning appreciation of the world around him? What, what gets him there? And maybe this uh, connects to some of your work that you did on, on worldview and philosophy of, and epistemology in Bovink. Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, Bovink, I think, well, there's two things there. I think Bovink has a thoroughly theological understanding of creation, right? He really believes that humanity are is made in the image of the triune God and humanity, even in sin, can't help but express something about the, the God that they're denying about, right? So even the worst unbelievers will end up confessing the truths that they are, though foundationally they might be denying the basis for those truths, they can't help but actually encounter reality and speak about reality. And also they feel the normative character of reality upon their lives, right? Bavink would oftentimes say Christianity um, speaks into the truths that we know in the heart that no human being could deny. There's no such thing as a real atheist for Bobbing is saying there in RD2. It's really from his understanding of Romans 1 and also the theological character of creation. But I also think that Bobbing uh, was cognizant of how nature alone cannot uh, help us understand supernatural truths and how nature alone can't actually uh, save us. Nature alone can't get us to uh, the salvific or Trinitarian truths of Christianity, and that uh, nature alone could be very much abused, right? And he, he does see this in a kind of dualistic structure that he encounters in both modern thought and also in, he thinks in forms of Roman Catholicism, especially as encountering the Roman Catholics of his own day and the secularist worldviews of his own day, or let's say materialist worldviews of his own day, right? Where a lot of what he thought they were saying was that by nature alone, you can get by an ordinary life. And religion was just something to get to kind of a second floor of supernatural grace. Uh, and he was very much against that kind of perspective. And he thought that uh, scripture, the Holy Spirit, and all of these things were necessary to understand nature. But notice that 
grace doesn't actually add anything substantial to nature. Grace restores nature. Grace helps you see nature aright. It doesn't get rid of nature, but it restores how nature is supposed to be look, looked at and how nature is supposed to function metaphysically, ethically, and epistemologically. So um, I think his doctrine of common grace is absolutely crucial here. That's how he thinks he could avoid this kind of dualism uh, between nature and grace. But also at the same time, this understanding that grace restores nature is not against nature. Yeah, I think that's helpful. I think that's something we um, sometimes undervalue today. I don't think historically we have, but the idea that, you know, God created everything to be good, very good. Yes, there was a fall. Yes, there are issues. But the kind of return to who we're meant to be naturally is entirely a good thing for us if we can discern what is good and right and pursue whatever that means in our context. Yeah. Um, so I'm interested in this, in this idea a little bit. Um, you know, in, in, in the past, uh, you know, I guess that, what is the phrase? Um, grace does not abolish nature, but perfects it. Yeah. Complete, in, in terms of completion, not making it better per se. It seems like Herman Bobbing um, grows onto that probably from the reformed scholastics and earlier medieval theologians. Mm -hmm. So he has a pretty uh, kind of positive understanding. I think maybe that could help us today. I, I kind of find it funny that most of us would all say gravity exists it's totally real mm -hmm. um even though it's sort of a scientific natural observation with kind of mathematical backgrounds mm -hmm. so there there's a real sense in which all of us even if we're the most skeptical about sort of cultural ideas and the you know the world all accept basic premises that everyone else does because they're because people can observe truth so i think that is that ends up being quite helpful i'm um, kind of mm -hmm. transitioning a little bit uh what is Bovink's view then of like original sin, the image of God, how does um, that correlate to the idea of being able to exist in culture and nature and maybe even perfect it through grace? Uh, what, what happens in the fall according to Bovink and what is, how does the image of God get damaged or not damaged or repair yeah. salvation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think you're right that, you know, when we're, when we're thinking about, for example, the Christian worldview, the Christian worldview is simply perceiving reality for what it is, right? The Christian worldview is not something subjective only in us. And hence, it's kind of just Christian truth that only Christians know. But rather, the Christian worldview declares reality. And it's the same reality that even the non-Christians are perceiving. The only difference is that the Christian worldview can give uh, a kind of reasoned account or metaphysical tracing back from what they perceive to things in themselves, right? Namely, God. Not things in themselves as in just objects in the world, but I mean, we're tracing back what we perceive to the origins of all things, the essence of all things, and everything came from the triune God. And so when we're thinking about uh, creation and also who we are as made in God's image, we are made again in the image of the triune God. And for Bobbing, pivoting away from worldview now to just image of God itself, uh, the image of God is not just considered in the individual in isolation. You know, we we know this from our reform tradition, medieval and, and church fathers. We normally talk about, I think, the image of God as, you know, the soul or reason or the capacity for religiosity and, and those sort of things. And Bavink agrees with all that, but he does say more. He says that the image of God is also manifested not just in individuals, but also in the entire human race, right? Because in God, there is this unity and diversity. In creatures, and especially those who bear his image, there's a kind of unity and diversity as well, too. So there's a diversity of individuals, but only as a single organic unity can we fully image God, right? Um, as members of the single human race, each member doing different and distinct things, we can all image God together. And what is that unity? Well, the federal headship of Adam or the federal headship of Christ. And so Adam's federal headship is not just by virtue of some kind of voluntaristic decree from God. Well, here's who's going to represent everybody, right? But rather Adam's federal headship is the one, it, it respects the Trinitarian character of humanity, right? So when, when Adam is appointed as the head of humanity, this is because humanity had to have a unity. And that unity is found with their ethical connectedness to Adam's federal representativeness. And so when we're thinking about original sin and what happens in original sin, uh, there's kind of a twofold, there's more to this, but, but for our purposes, there's kind of a twofold effect. The first is, of course, the individual is guilty and corrupt. That's classical. 
But at the same time, Bavink has a lot of emphases, and you see this come out, especially in this Reform Ethics and RD 2 and 3, Reform Dogmatics Volume 2 and 3, the social dimension of uh, original sin and its impact on you, right? So he says that um, the, the crux of sin, the, the root of all sin is self-love. There's this tying off, this, sorry, this, this cutting off of bonds and ties with the rest of the members of the human race. There's this turning towards the self, which again, is a very reformed idea, but he has, he's, he's very much emphasizing the social implications of that. If all of the individual people of the organism of the human race are cutting themselves off from the rest of humanity, then the organism of human race of the human race doesn't function together anymore because now all we have are isolated members. Uh, think about just limbs that don't really have any more function, right? You cut off your arm, the arm's just kind of on its own. The body doesn't function, the arm doesn't function. There's that organic imagery in Bavink that's very important for him. And so the redemption that we see in Christ is a kind of cosmic dimension. This is why he was critical of what he found to be resident in pietism and even forms of asceticism, whether or not he was completely fair. Um, I'll, I'll leave that to the experts on pietism and so on. But he basically says pietists and ascetics seem to focus on individual piety, but they don't see redemption as not just changing the individual, but also changing social relationships, changing the state, changing family, changing every sphere of life because life is lived out in relationships. And so you see this Kuyperian tinge where there's this very much cosmological understanding of redemption, not just of souls, but of individuals in relation to others. So the organic human race and all of its cultural parts united together in Christ, right? So he talks about the kingdom of God as an organism as well. So there's just a lot there, individual dimensions, social dimensions. Hmm. I think that's helpful. It's a pretty uh, expansive view. I like how you're, the way that you kind of articulated his view of humanity. There's sort of a unity and diversity, a one and many-ness to it. And it, it probably, and maybe this is a good follow-up to that idea. I'm sure this then explains how Christ becomes our new head and therefore can redeem the human race in a way parallel to how Adam rightly was our federal head and could therefore <laughs> represent the human race. Could you kind of correlate those ideas in Bob Inc., or at least maybe even kind of synthesize yeah. with your understanding of it as well? Yeah. So uh, that when Christ is the head of the new humanity, this really is, he's the head of a, of a renewed organic human race where, Again, just as Adam was created to be a corporate reality, right? Adam was created as the federal head of a corporate reality where all of the human race were supposed to spread out the world, spread out in the world and, and image God as prophet, priest, and king. The, God's viceroys reflecting the glory of God throughout all of uh, the cosmos and creation. So now in Christ, the new federal head of the renewed humanity, you will see this cosmic uh, eschaton of all of renewed humanity together in their different ways, reflecting as the singular image of God uh, with all of humanity together as a single organic unity. So that's right, the, the correlation there. And here, I think in play here is a kind of Kuyperian understanding of the antithesis as well, right? Unregenerate humanity in Adam and renewed humanity in Christ, right? There's an antithesis ultimately between unregenerate humanity and regenerate humanity that figures into Bavink as well. Now, there does seem to be an interesting correlation. So there's, if you want to say pietism, and again, I'm not trying to actually say what, what pietism was, but just in the, in the language of Bavink, it sort of has an, an individualistic bent. And I would probably suggest that a lot of our kind of current North Amer Pacific, North American, English speaking Christians also share this sort of individualistic bent. And it strikes me that um, his about Bavink's emphasis on sort of a cosmic reconciliation is something that most of us, I don't think we would consider. Like, I think we think of ourselves as individuals who on the basis of our faith get saved and therefore we're kind of individually saved. And yeah, we join the, the body of, of Christ, which is the church. There's a bit of a unity there, but it seems to me that Bavink is, is opening up kind of a different avenue. One I would actually argue is much more traditional. In fact, yeah. 
uh, Christ as the kind of cosmic reconcilers throughout, I think, scripture and church history. And of course, Romans 8 is pretty well known that the idea there that even creation itself is awaiting for, for its final redemption, not just individual humans within creation, but the entire cosmos. So could you yeah. just kind of maybe expand a little bit on that? Because I, that is something I think probably we need to retrieve and, and reaffirm, especially in an age where many people feel lonely, isolated, um, this idea of, yeah. of a sort of unity that we have. Can you just kind of expand on that a little bit? Just maybe synthesize, think out loud. Yeah, that's a, great, that's a great question. And uh, your reflections, I think, are on point there. Uh, so if for Boving, the root of all sin is egocentricity, it cuts off the self from the rest of the organism of the human race, the organism to which we belong, the organism that we were supposed to be created for, then he thinks that the spirit's work in restoring humanity, renewed humanity, is precisely in creating bonds of fellowship, bonds of fellowship forged in love, right? And so Boving is quite critical of accounts of ethics that focus on what are the... Uh, individual habits that you have to do as a person and, 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 you know, what kind of a kind of ethics that seem to focus on yourself and the kind of achievements that you can achieve for yourself, whether that's about how much quiet time you're spending and things like that, or, you know, how much prayer, not that he's saying that prayer is bad, but prayer is for an end to the glory of God. And if that glory is going to be reflected in renewed humanity, prayer leads us, to community and prayers to be done in community, right? So there's this strongly corporate dimension to his understanding of sin. And in parallel to that, there's also a strongly corporate identity to his understanding of renewal and redemption, such that it is when Christians come together and they're engaging in the world as, uh, as uh, those who are renewed in Jesus Christ, they're testifying and witnessing to this renewed community of uh, the final new heavens and the new earth. Right? Not that we're bringing that about here now right? in a kind of triumphalist, crassly transformationalist kind of way, as caricatures of neo-Calvinism often characterize it to be, but as um, witnessing to this final community where we're not rejecting one another, but rather we are bounded to one another and we're taking responsibility for one another. Rather than saying, I am my own man and I have nothing to do with you, I'm going to take a responsibility for you. And I think that creates a kind of other-centered ethic, which is very neo-Calvinistic. I love that. I remember talking to a friend recently um, about personhood and just kind of and, uh, said this or something like this. Could you imagine a person who was born, say, like in a, I don't know, like a machine, who never interacted with another human being or thing his, his or her entire life, but was always just there? No voice, no touch, no communication that's almost an abhorrent thought because what would that person be? Most of us would say like, there's, there's nothing to that person. They would be such a, a wild thing to, to even conceive of. And I think that tells you something that we're as people, we are essentially uh, united to each other personally. And we become who we are by our parental uh, touch, voice, care, or lack of care by our friendships. We're almost, now we are individuals, but we're also an accumulation of relationships that are bound up in, in who we are as people and in our identity. And so it strikes me then on a second point that a lot of us, possibly because at least where I live, we're in a more individualistic society. We think of sin only, and it is, but only in the vertical way, like you offend God. Yeah. Granted, that is true. I'm not at all trying to say it's not true. That is true. And yet... Throughout scripture, not even in just a little bit of scripture, but throughout scripture, sin has this sort of horizontal implication. It destroys relationships. It separates families. It, it uh, makes a household impure. It causes harm to you and to others. Um, the book of Proverbs even is just a whole thing about how um, being unwise can ruin your life. And so it strikes me that Boving's view of this sort of... Um, I don't know, this sort of broad body of Christ, horizontal personality, transformation is the wrong word, but just relational personality, uh, I think can be quite helpful. And I think on the third thing, I love the idea that Bobbing brings that ego is, and self-love is sort of the heartbeat of sin, because what it does, 
Yeah, it separates you from God, but it separates you from the community. And you become yeah. an isolated individual because of your, I don't know, egotism. Yeah. So he's almost a little bit ahead of the curve here, I feel like, or at least a bit prophetic to, uh, to some of the problems that Europe and North America are facing now yeah. in terms of uh, expressive individualism. So, so maybe at a more, like, because you're a pastor, at a more, in a more practical way, how do you think Bovink's expansive view of personality and relationships could really be a solve and a help to us today who live in these sort of expressive individualistic societies? Yeah, uh, that's great. Thanks. And I, I think one way that it could be helpful is to encourage self-forgetfulness and to see that you can't really image God in isolation from community, right? That, um, so, so Bobby, again, I'm thinking about his reformed ethics. He, he thinks that asceticism and pietism has a kind of self-focused understanding of achievements where you focus on what you can do by yourself and how do you cultivate holiness by yourself. But what if it, to image God well, you need to be in corporate solidarity with others, again, taking responsibility for one another, but also entering into relationships that are not just with one another with respect to the church, but also with regard to the world that the way in which Christianity is, is, is a positive impact is just, it's, it's in renewing individuals, we become also agents that leaven culture, right? There's this idea involving that the church is not just a prole, namely beautiful in itself, that the church, uh, you know, gets believers together to behold God. We want to be, we want to seek out the basic vision. We want to be in union with Christ. This is all very, very good things. But as, individuals are renewed and they're beholding Christ will also be agents of leavening culture in the sense that it's precisely in our relations with others in the world. Can we also draw them to Christ? And so Bobbing is not going to be critical of someone who's a scholar, for example, deeply engaged in the sciences as to that's going to be compromising this Christian identity, right? He's, in, he's encouraging Christians to be deeply rooted in the world, not of it, right? But in it, in the sense that, they're cultivating, understanding relationships with others. And this is exactly how Christianity can be a positive impact to those around them and also attract them towards Christ. Mm. So kind of segueing a little bit, but on this topic of community, of personality, of relational, re relationality, um, Bob Inc., I think, had a little bit of an expansive view on the idea of Catholicity, the idea of we are kind of one church, united by faith and there's a real sense in which we can work with one another can you just kind of talk to his view of catholicity what that looked like for him yeah that's a fantastic question and it's such a broad question because he has written so much about it that you can go at it from a, from a variety of angles i think for bobbing i mean Catholicity, of course, is a an attribute of the church, you know, the church Catholic in the sense that there's one faith, a universal faith that ties every individual church member, every Christian together, right? One baptism and so on, and one 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 faith and one Lord and Savior. So Catholicity is broadest sense, of course, Bob and Confirms, but there's also Catholicity as a reformed theologian. In other words, how do we as reformed theologians think about how we do work? in a Catholic way. And for him, Catholicity isn't just about uh, rooting your doctrine or your theology to the past, but it's also laboring for the future. There's truth in every age. And so there's a sense in which you shouldn't just expect the past to be helpful to you. You should also expect the present to be helpful to you and how you do dogmatics, how you do theology, such that Again, because the truth is available to everyone, you're going to be expecting to encounter the truth uh, no matter who you turn to. Uh, there's also an interesting factor here, perhaps the third dimension, Bobbing, and this is perhaps the most surprising. Bobbing understands Catholicity as manifesting itself in the diversity of the confessions of the various churches of Protestantism. So, for example, he says, Roman Catholicity is a contradiction in terms because Roman Catholicity he would argue it's limiting Catholicity to one expression and one nation and what Rome has always upheld. But Catholicity is this almost multiform, well, not almost, he actually uses the word multiform, <laughs> way in which uh, the gospel spreads out to all the nations and each nation will 
receive that gospel and articulate the God of that gospel in its own distinct way. So when Bobbing, for example, travels to America, he criticizes America and he actually says that American preachers are very much like celebrity preachers. They use flowery language. They talk about grandiose things, but there's actually very little substance. And our America, he says, you know, for better or for worse, uh, could make a, a good home for Arminianism because of its focus on piety and works and so on and, and, and effectiveness and efficiency. But he says, well, that's okay because America is not the Netherlands and Calvinism isn't the only truth. And there's this idea that to be truly Catholic, you can't identify uh, your nation or your confession as the truth uh, because every Christian church, every Christian uh, uh, community, as they organically receive the faith, will speak of that faith in their own unique way, in their own organic locations. And so he sees this kind of unity and diversity motif too in Catholicity, where the Netherlands, we're going to have our churches and our theologies, in it, and of course connected to everything else, but we're going to have a distinct character to it. America will have a distinct character to it. German will have a distinct character to it. There's Scottish. She also mentions the Scot Scottish free churches will have a distinct character to it. And that's okay. That's actually an expression of, of, of Catholicity. That's not a threat. This interpretive uh, uh, um, multiformity, some people might say, is, a you know, there's a critique of Protestantism there because there's so many different views and interpretations and so on. But Obama says, let it be because we're an organic faith. We own this faith. And so we shouldn't be surprised that in our freedoms, we express this faith in a different way in different uh, localities. So that's probably kind of his own unity and diversity spin to Catholicity. And I think that's worth exploring further too. That's helpful. I think you mentioned at the end that one of the critiques of Protestantism is that it's so wide ranging that there's kind of a lack of unity. And, and probably we go too far, I think, but the, I, I think, I think Bobbing's right. I mean, the idea that we have a diversity of expression, I mean, if you're a Canadian, you're going to have a, a different expression of faith than someone from Texas or someone from Jakarta, probably. Mm. And that's okay. That's not a problem. Yeah. yeah, there's 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 things that we unite on that are kind of central and strong, but there's there's just different ways we might put things, different emphases. So you mentioned the Americas, there was a bit more pragmatism, a bit more, you know, a different kind of preaching style and all those sorts of things. And yet we can be thankful for even those, even if they differ from us and be maybe not suspicious. Uh, yeah. Because I think, at least my read, is that suspicion of those who differ from us is one of our Achilles heels as reformed kind of Protestant thinkers. Yeah. And I think that Bobby would actually come back to his understanding of uh, grace restoring nature that naturally, if the Mago Day were to naturally spread out through the whole world, there will be diversity, right? So he doesn't see the Tower of Babel, for example, and what God did there in spreading out the people from the Tower of Babel, right? And confusing their languages. Yes, it's a response to sin, but it's also a kind of blessing in the sense that this is the original trajectory mm. that God had intended creation to take place, that there would be people spread out all over. And if people are spread out all over, there's going to be natural diversification, mm. but still together in our diversity, because we worship a God who is himself unity and diversity. We shouldn't be afraid of the diversity that we see here too. I think that last point is especially helpful too, in a day where we're talking about things like ethnocentrism and there's, various issues surrounding that. But the idea that the Tower of Babel in one sense is God's common grace to help people realize what is good naturally, namely the yes. diversity of language and expression. And I think when you come to, to visions of the future, visions of eschatology and scripture, you see things like every tribe, tongue, and nation praising God according to the, their diversity. And that doesn't just disappear that seems to be something that is part and parcel of what it means to live in the new heavens and new earth and to yeah. worship God there. Well, that's entirely fascinating. So we've had a bit of an introduction to Herman Bovink, his ways of thinking, his ways of interacting with the world, the image of God, original sin, Catholicity. Uh, my guess is that there'll be some people who know Bovink, who've read his stuff, but there'll be some people who haven't. So what are the books that people need to read by Herman Bovink, and then maybe after that about Herman Bovink. 
So primary and yeah. secondary sources. Uh, great question. I think uh, as a starting point, his wonderful works of God is fantastic. Westminster Seminary Press had uh, republished a new edition of it. So that's a great work to introduce yourself to because I think there is kind of bobbing without the, without the footnotes, right? It's bobbing and it's him trying to articulate his theology without all the nitty gritty material that you'd find in the reform dogmatics. And in some ways it's a, it's a more mature work, right? It's, it's written, I think about a decade after his reform dogmatics was written. So he really does articulate and crystallize his views there in a very clear way. So that's a good entry point. But then of course, use that as a roadmap. If you're interested, let's say in his chapter on creation and providence, then go to the reform dogmatics where you would see a great expansion and elaboration on it and how he relates his views to theologians in the past and philosophers to the present, for example. Um, so the reform dogmatics would be the second thing I would recommend. But of course, I think if you want to get his kind of mature thoughts on worldview, metaphysics, epistemology, check out his Christian worldview book that we've translated and also his philosophy of revelation and the stone lectures. But those are, I actually think kind of heavier reads than say wonderful works of God. Um, about Herman Loving, I have to mention James Eglinton's uh, book, Trinity and Organism, 2012, through Bloomsbury, the TNT Clark series, the studies in systematic theology series in, in TNT Clark. Um, that of Bovink, which is very helpful. And of course, if you want to read on the image of God and human destiny, Brian Matson's book, I think it was published in the same year from Brill. Uh, that was a really useful work. Um, I tried to build on those two works, especially, and my own book was uh, God and Knowledge in 2020. It was just published in the same series as James's and Bloomsbury, TNT Clark Studies and Systematic Theology. And I basically explore how Bavink's uh, theology and theological epistemology is very eclectic. Uh, he uses uh, medieval and reform and modern sources in a very eclectic and principally reformed way. And I just try to show his sources and also show the, the metaphysical underpinnings to his worldview perspective and also show how he is applying classical reformed ideas to very distinct and acute modern issues with, in, in modern grammar. So uh, I would hope that that would be useful to some as well. Thanks for that. Great. It was great talking to you. I really appreciate it. And I felt like I've learned a bunch. Thanks so much, Vlad. It's great to be here.